Okay. So, sorry about that. We had some minor technical difficulties. Apparently the video was lagging a little bit. Hopefully this uh, helped some. If not, just uh, let us know. It's better? Good, good, it's better. <laughs> there we go. So I'll just do a quick recap on uh, where we were. But basically I was talking about how this project got started. Um, we were prompted by a design agency called Frog to design a skateboard, right? And uh, the question then is, you know, what does it mean when a company like uh, MakerBot designs a skateboard? And kind of the obvious answer, if you guys want, uh, is to actually print it, right? And that comes with a mo uh, many challenges, specifically, well, material challenges, the size of the skateboard, right? You want something that you can ride on. And, uh, well, you know, we put our hands to work and this is what we came up with. So, we started with a very simple concept, or a very simple question, I guess, right? We wanted to print a, a skateboard. And uh, part of that challenge was, well, what is the design going to be, right? What's a, what's a proposal that we want to pitch uh, within this, this concept, within this uh, scenario, assuming that we are able to print it, right? And the very first challenge that we came up with was just the sheer size of the, of the, um, of the skateboard, right? How do we make something big enough that can actually be writable? Because most printers will only offer, you know, somewhere between seven to 10 uh, inches. That's close to, uh, let's say, 20 to 35 uh, centimeters. Uh, and that reduces a lot your ability to print larger things. However, funny enough, uh, here at MakerBot, we had access to the, the Z18 printer, right? So we were able to print something as tall as uh, 18 inches. But it wasn't quite enough, right? And we started playing with that idea of, well, how do we maximize the print volume of our printer? And I'll just take you guys first uh, on the, onto the actual design of the skateboard, right? Personally, I really like using Rhino. Here at uh, MakerBot, we use mainly, I would say, three softwares, uh, so different software types. It's Rhino, uh, which is the one that I'm going to be talking about today. Fusion 360, uh, that's really popular, especially on EDU and uh, SOLIDWORKS. So most of our engineering team uh, works on SOLIDWORKS. But for this exercise, we went into Rhino and uh, I started just scoping out a basic shape, right? This is a very kind of uh, archetypical skateboard. You see it kind of has a front end and a tail end, a little bit of a kick on the tail for you to, to be able to raise it up. Basically, the, the way that I did this surface, and now it's exploded, so it's going to be easier for me to, f to show you guys how this one worked out. But you can see the idea, the basic idea was to create the, the main outline, you know, uh, coming from the top and then giving myself a guide curve, which is this side curve that you guys can see here in yellow. That, would, that is giving me that cross section, that little kick on the back and flat in the front uh, to create kind of, uh, you know, uh, a basic uh, shape of a skateboard, right? To create the, the main challenge with this one specifically is just the the main I would say the main uh, surface of the skateboard which is the top one, um, so it's it's nothing much you know or beyond a simple loft and and we can talk about more modeling skills moving forward if you guys are interested in that as well, but for this one I was just uh, you know a couple of curves then doing um, a couple of sweeps and lofts and then I wanted to to add a little bit of a a chamfer here in the bottom, uh, so to help with the rigidity of the structure. Why? That was just maybe kind of a gut feeling uh, on the fact that you know it was going to be smashing against that edge, so I wanted a, a more soft edge against to which it could smash. Uh, and from that very basic surface, I uh, started adding some details to to the top part specifically, right? Because we know that many, many skateboards, or all of them, come with this sandpaper on top, right? The sandpaper helps a lot with the uh, grip. And we wanted to use not necessarily sandpaper, but maybe we could embed that grippy feature on the skateboard itself, which is why I started adding these, um, say, pimples, uh, uh, pimple features <laughs> in the skateboard. Uh, and for this one, I actually used a program, a parametric so, uh, program we talked about last time called Grasshopper. We could also uh, do some a more in-depth look into it. I won't, I won't stop too much on it, but you can see kind of the idea, right? The idea being I basically split the surface in a given a number of uh, elements using this diamond pattern. Um, let me come back here to my video. So the diamond, the diamond pattern basically, you know, you have a set of points 
right? Let's say these three points. And the next point over will be just uh, moved half, half a point uh, down or sideways, or depends on, on how you call it, right? Like so. And the next ones will be moved again back up and back down and so on and so forth. So if you were to connect them, that's why we call them uh, diamond patterns, right? If you were to connect these, these points very simply, you start getting these uh, uh, rhomboid shapes, these kind of uh, elongated uh, rectangles. So that was a, the pattern that I was using here in Grasshopper to, to create uh, the skateboard. Uh, and as you can see, there's another change because the dimples have different diameters depending on where they're at. So I used an attractor here at the center line that was helping me guide the amount of the size of the radius, uh, the size of the radius in the in the dimples, right? So the very center ones were fairly big, and as we moved out uh, to to the outer edge, to the better perimeter of the board, those dimples would would get smaller. The idea being, again, you needed more grip uh, in the center because that's where also the force is going to be applied, and on the edges you could make do with uh, a little bit less uh, than that. Um, kept moving, you know, uh, again, as I kept uh, iterating on the board, I was focusing mainly on the single surface, because since it's a very, um, let's say, uh, minimal object, you only need to solve mostly, or first you really need to solve that simple surface that's going to be the top edge of the board before you're able to move forward, right? So you really want to narrow that down. Uh, but at this point, we were already printing, and I'll, I'll show you guys in a minute what uh, what we printed and how that process came along. But I'll, I'll just keep moving uh, a little bit further into the to the design um, before showing some of the the example of the prototypes that we did and how they well didn't quite perform as expected. Uh, but we'll get to that in a minute. So second concept was uh, this this one was a really interesting one. I, I liked it a lot. It's called uh, uh, Boronoi cells. What those cells are. And it's, it's based out of that same parametric logic, right? So what you're doing is you're trying to split a surface uh, in an even amount of cells. So if you think about these cells, they are behaving very much like, and I'll, I'll show you guys it in here because I think it's, it's much more appealing, right? Um, they're, they're behaving very much like bubbles. So let me go back here to the, to the screen. And uh, actually, Alison, could you hand me some paper? But I'll, I'll draw here on the side. I think it's on the floor. No, no, no. Uh, do we we'll erase? Uh -huh. yeah, so go. with Voronoi, what's happening is that, is, you know, like what happened here with the subdivision of the surface using a diamond pattern, what the Voronoi surface is trying to do, let's say that this is a very, you know, uh, flat example of my, my board. This is our, the four edges of the board. So what it's doing is it's, it's distributing a set of points within that area, right? So I have, let's say, one, two, three, four, five points. And what it'll do is from that point, it'll start growing you know, little arches from each of the points on. Um, let me see. I think, let me know if you, can, if, if you can see the diagrams, okay? Until they start hitting each other, right? So what happens here is that very much like when you blow up a bubble and you know how uh, if I was to draw uh, two bubbles colliding, what you would see would be, let's say, this is my floor plane, right? Uh, so I would have my ellipse, my first bubble, and let's say they are intersecting, so this would be my second bubble. The area at which the bubbles intersect is this flat element right here, right? And seen from the top, it very much looks like, let's see, yeah, you guys can see this. Is, is from the top, you would see something very much, uh, you know, close like a, a, like a pen diagram, but you can see how, you know, where those two bubbles collide, you create a very sharp edge. And, you know, if you had a third bubble here, can you still see here in the bottom? Yeah. Uh, if I did a third bubble here, then these edges start becoming flat, right? So that's what a Voronoi diagram is doing. It's basically, Starting from a set of points that you've divided your surface uh, into, right? And then expanding circles from those points until they reach each other or they reach the edge of the surface. So that's what ha what's happening here. Uh, and, you know, since I already had, again, my basic uh, archetypical skateboard shape or silhouette, I was able to just project those points. I can move this one um, a little bit to the top. Whoop. 
Let me, here we go. Right. So I was able to just simply take, take those uh, the generated tiles or uh, negative spaces and project them into my into my board, right? So cutting out those those sections. And I started at this point, as you can see here, adding the four um, bolt elements where the, the trucks are going to be tied into, right? But here at the bottom also starting kind of adding a little bit of a carve out for me to be able to nest the the trucks, right? So that the trucks would have a very secure location and attachment to the board. Um, and you know that one worked reasonably okay. Uh, we'll we'll get to the <laughs> to the videos of how it worked in a second. But after this one, we realized that well, you know, it was kind of um, not boring, but it wasn't really working for us to have this single um, surface going up like that little kick in the back. And there was no really real reason for us to have a, a forward and a backward. Um, element, you know, a front, say, a front and a rear section of the board, but we really, we wanted to have something more symmetrical so that it would be easier for you to use when you're doing uh, tricks and stuff like that, just because if you side, if you have your board sided, so if you have differences in the front and the, and the rear end of the board, then it's going to be trickier to play with it, right, to do like track stands or to, to, to actually do um, tricks on the board. So that's where we first changed the, the, the silhouette of the board. And we moved on to what you see here, where the kick is happening uh, at both ends. Right? Would you have it uh, both in the front and in the back? And then you're left with this catenary arch that's going from truck, front truck to rear truck throughout in an even, in an even way. However, when, when we printed that one, the issue with it was, uh, I don't know if you guys can guess it, but the thing here is that by having, uh, let me move back to, 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 to the camera, but by having that, ex, that, that super, even, even if, you, if it's shallow, but that, that curve guiding the trucks, you're putting so much pressure already in the, tr in, the, in, the, in the board, right? So it's acting like a spring and it's already bent. So there's not much room for it to go other than to snap, which actually happened. Uh, and then, you know, after, it's, it's a thing with not testing the prototype or not testing the CAD file. Not until you print it and you get it out of the machine, you're actually able to, to realize those, min, you know, the minutiae around the design process and, and, the, and then those mistakes that can be overseen uh, while you're developing uh, your design, while you're developing your object. But anyways, so what happened with that one was uh, it actually just snapped in half uh, very easily. So here's just the same one, but a little bit more polished. We printed that one out. It didn't quite work okay. And worse, <laughs> you know, worse than just printing it out, we actually added um, a reverse uh, type of grip in this one. So very much like the dimple design that I showed you at the, be uh, at the beginning, for this one, we started at coring out material from the design, right? So we projected these holes and we carved them out from the from the from the body, which would give us you know a reasonable grip on the surface. It's adding a little bit of a feature that your feet can attach to. However, naturally, all of these dimples really compromise the integra the the structure of the board, right? The structural integrity of the board. Um, so as soon as we stood on the board, it actually snapped. You know, especially in the front. You can see right here. Actually, I can give you guys the dimensions, but it's going to be you know less than yeah, ten, ten, you know, right here is about 10 millimeters uh, from the very edge between these two features, let's see. Yeah, 9.6. So the features are really close together, right? They, they are so close that actually the material is not able to bridge enough and to, to, to transfer the loads across those holes. And it's just trying, you know, the, the, the breaking points are just connecting each other out and creating this snapping section. So right here, on the very very front of the board, the board would snap. Uh, we had we, we had fun with it because it you know we, we had our uh, director of creative Andrew Askedal trying it out and uh, yeah well he face planted a couple of times uh, he won't like that but he did uh, <laughs> so we moved on from that one uh, we didn't quite I mean we knew or I knew that it was going to be a challenge to create a board that had uh, you know a lot of holes on it a lot of um, complexity to it, especially once you start getting to these type of patterns. 
But I, I still wanted to try it out. I wanted to make sure that, uh, you know, kind of to, to, to get to a point that we could balance out both a complex look that had to be associated with 3D printing and, well, the performance that, you know, the simple uh, answer to the question, hey, the board needs to work, the board needs to withstand your weight, right? So in this case, what I did was I created different patterns using that same Voronoi logic um, and I projected those patterns to different levels of the surface. So what's happening here, although you know the, these sur surfaces have been already merged, but all there is is that I'm projecting the different patterns one on top of the other, and and then I'm just say gluing it together. It's just a Boolean operation, a Boolean union here uh, in Rhino, uh, and I'm only respecting uh, the areas at which the trucks are going to be attached. Right, so I don't want to compromise where the trucks are. This one actually performed surprisingly well. It was hard to print, uh, but it did it did it did okay. I would say it's uh, you know especially the look out of it, and you'll you'll see it in a minute in, in the pictures. But it, it really looks uh, really nice, right? So you you can see it here in just the the shaded view viewport. The look that you get is it's it's rather nice. Um, maybe with a different process, uh, it would be a, an interesting one to try out. But you know for this one, it would still break, but uh, it worked okay. So at this point, I'll just go back here and start talking about what happened once we started trying to print the, 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 the boards out, right? And as I said before, uh, the thing here was, even though we had access to a very big printer, the Z18, uh, we wanted to create something a little bit bigger, right? Because at 18 inches, you get something more closer to the size of a penny board, which is going to be really, almost really short. Uh, and we were wondering, well, how do we expand that? And it's just, you know, as simple as using the hypotenuses on the printer itself, especially because of the way that this printer is oriented, the fact that the largest axis is the z-axis, and the other two, the x and y, are, uh, you know, not actually rationally, uh, are noticeably shorter than the, than the z-axis, helped us in create these not so steep hypotenuses and the steepness correlates to the need for supports right so the thing here was as you start using the hypotenuses in your printer regardless of the printer that you're using right you'll be able to extend a lot a lot the the linear the maximum linear dimension that you can uh, print with your printer but but you know kind of the caveat here is that as you extend that linear dimension and as you put this object free floating in space you are going to be stressing out more and more the need for supports in the object, right? So if I print, um, and I'll go back here, and I actually I show you guys what I mean in a second, but uh, if I printed a, a, an object, let me fade here to this. If I printed an object vertically, we all know that you know all of the layers stack on top of each other, so you don't need that much uh, supports. As I start tilting the object to one side or the other, there's a threshold at which these uh, items will fall off of the print if I don't have a support structure that uh, goes along, right? And in MakerBot printers, that's set up to 65 degrees. Luckily, this line uh, is way less than 65. It's actually right on the border. It's actually it's around um, 70 degrees uh, when you when you trace that uh, second hypotenuse. And by second, I mean I'm calling first hypotenuse the one that's just you know x-axis versus z-axis, and then the combined one, the one that goes from one corner of the printer to the very uh, outermost corner of the printer is kind of the second hypotenuse. Or I'm referring to it like that. If, if somebody knows how that's called, uh, once you have a prism and you have like kind of the hypotenuse running through the main cord of it, it'd uh, be great to know. I, I really don't know if there's a technical term, term for that. But anyways, so we were able to use that, that hypotenuse because of the ratio between the two dimensions in the printer, right? So when you have the 12 inches on the, on, on the x-axis, we also had 12 inches on the, on the y-axis. And on the z-axis, you have, you know, 50% more, so it's 18 inches. And we ended up being able to print something as long as 24 inches. So that's almost 40% more linear dimension that we were able to extract from our printers without using support. So that was a, the clever, clever part um, to it. And I'll show you what I mean right now with MakerBot Print, right? So here, uh, uh, this is our uh, MakerBot Print software. And all I did was I took one of the skateboards, uh, I imported it here, and I'm showing you guys what it means you know, to slice it if you have the need for support. So I'm already putting this geometry 
in that big uh, hypotenuse right here. But because of the way that I have the settings set up, um, I'm actually going to require a lot of supports. And this, I, I made it purposely so because I wanted to show you guys what it meant. And I, I have some prints to show as well later uh, in the video, but what it meant to, to, to use supports. But as I said, traditionally in most printers, and that's the case uh, for MakerBot specifically, the support angle or the, the kind of suggested support angle is 65 degrees. So if you change the angle to 65 degrees and you re-slice it, you realize that the print is able to finish without supports. And that's a great part of it. Because you're not only, I, you're A, extending the maximum linear dimension. So right now, instead of talking about 18 inches, we're talking about 24. And at 24 inches, you've got a, a decent board, right? Uh, it's, it's not too bad. And it's slicing on the background while we talk. Uh, but you got the 24 inches, and you're also not using supports, which is going to save you a lot of time, like a lot, a lot. The previous one with supports would have been close to 36 hours. I'm using Minfill, which also helps uh, quite a bit with the, with the um, print time. But even then, I'm betting that this one might come at 19, 20 hours, maybe, uh, just because of the fact that uh, you're not using supports, right? So I'm saving somewhere between 6 to 10 hours just by not using support, which is a lot. Uh, and you know, every, every hour that you save in printing is an hour that you save in the print possibly failing. And I actually, uh, and I know that this is going to be a little bit tricky to see from this angle, but I'll, I'll bring you guys into the printer. So we paused one of the prints. Sorry. It's going to be messy and, and you guys get close. Oh, there's Alison. You can see Alison right there. <laughs> uh, but you can see what I mean here, right? So. This, uh, we post the print mid midway, um, and what's happening here is you can see how the the, 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 the the skateboard is being printed tilted like that without the need, let's see, I'll, I'll bring it out for a second, I, I don't want to yeah. cancel it, but without the need for supports, right? So you can see how it's printing almost, and it's kind of magical almost, right? To see how it's, uh, oh, sorry. Um, how it's uh, free floating um, in space like that, and uh, you know, with the implications that we've discussed uh, just now. So the fact that you're you're saving a lot of time and you're also creating something that um, oh, which I forgot, it's also going to be something that's more robust. And the reason for that is comes down to the to the layer alignment. So let me go back to the drawing board while this finishes slicing. Uh, so up to this point, if anybody has questions, this would be a good time to ask them. Uh, well, I'll clean this up. Alison would let me know if we have any questions. Otherwise, just bear with me for a second. Oh, we already have a couple. Okay. Uh, some people were asking about when you were designing with the dimples and the, and the bubbles, uh -huh. um, if the mechanical resistance wasn't diminished by the cells. If the mechanical resistance, I'm not sure what you mean by the mechanical resistance. If you're referring to uh, kind of the the sturdiness of the board, um, not really because of the I increase also the, the number of shells, and we'll talk about the shells as well uh, on this layer. Uh, on while well, we talk about printing and slicing and whatnot, but let's start with that question on the dimples, right? So you're right. If you have, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, you guys can see here. You have just that straight line. Let's say that I'm going to draw first just the cross section of the board, right? So the board, the cross section, is going to be close to just a rectangle. Right? Um, if you have that re rectangle and you'll have a structure that probably looks like that, you know, kind of like excess, I'm sure that you guys have seen it, um, inside, that's giving you the infill. When, when you add the dimples, so if, you, if I had the same idea but with the dimples, what you would get is this sort of Lego-like profile, right? And then this challenges a little bit the way that the infill is going to perform. However, the solution for this one was to increase the number of shells because as I increase the number of shells, and I'll try to do it fairly exaggerated here, right? So that's that would be my two shells. At three shells in this case, the dimple is almost gone. And there is a point at which, depending on the height of the dimple, the dimple is invisible for the shells, right? So for the innermost shell, it's going to be performing almost the same way as the original one. So it, it'll transfer the load uh, linearly, directly, you know, through or jumping and skipping the, the, the dimples themselves. 
And the other thing that I wanted to touch on, uh, is we, we need to get better, uh, <laughs> better erasers. I'm sorry about that. But the other thing that I wanted to touch to touch on was the layer addition, and, and that's talking about how the plastic is laid on top of each other uh, when talking about the layers, right? So if we thought about the two possibilities. So here I have my first board that's completely oriented vertically uh, on the, on the uh, z-axis, right? So each layer would be basically like a cake, uh, you know, placed on top of one another. The challenge with this one is that as soon as I turn the board one on its side, all of the layers are going to be lining up parallel to my to the to the to my weights, right? To the perpendicular for. Uh, let me know if you guys can see this properly, but I know it's kind of uh, a little bit small. But as I apply the forces, the the force in the layer in in the contact points with the layers is going to be really big, right? And what happened when we when, when we instead of you know printing it, and that's, this is our z axis. When printing it vertically, uh, entirely vertically, and when it's starting to, to tilt it a little bit, and for that, I'll just do it, you know, simplifying it a little bit, but printing it like that, now the layers are just a tiny bit shifted over, right? But they are not quite coming. So if I if I turn, let's see, this is my C axis again, right? This is my C. Um, but they are not longer parallel to each other specifically when you put the board on its side. So once I put the board on its side, now the layer lines are slanted. And what this means is that as soon as I apply the force uh, in that board, that slantness is going to challenge the, to help the plastic keep grip on itself, right? Because instead of Instead of trying to, you know, if you think about it, just trying to break a set of wooden planks that are lined up like that, basically any one of the seams is going to give away when you apply a force. If you slant it a little bit, then you, you're no longer just trying to peel off one of the seams, but you're rather trying to slide them sideways. And that's much harder because there's already the resistance of each of the seams trying to attach uh, each other. And the load, by not having it be perpendicular to the seam, then we're taking into, into consideration not the perpendicular load, but rather the component on the load that's going to be uh, applied on, on each of the seams. And the component, just you know, based on the, on, on, on if, I don't want to get too technical here, but based on the trigonometry classes, you remember that it's going to be smaller than the main one, right? So once I apply the load like that, we will have one component, let's call it uh, shear y and shear x so the shear y and the shear total shear total any one of these components uh, is going to be smaller than the, than the than the original one yes cool uh, another question is how do you make sure that this adheres to the build plate because this is not a lot of material that is a good question actually um, and for that I would refer to I, I'll go back to to make a print so here you can see I changed a little bit the, the, the support settings and it's already helping me quite a bit uh, but what I want to talk on that question is specifically what you guys are asking regarding the first contact layer. Uh, let me zoom in a little bit. I'm sorry, it's kind of laggy because of the, it's kind of processing both the camera and the screen and whatnot. Uh, but all of these first layer, right? That's what's generating the addition to the to the to the to the build plate. What we have in MakerBot Print is called brims and padded bases. Um, I I'm pretty sure. Uh, let's deactivate rafts. So what happens when you use brims? Uh, should be faster. Give me one second. Yeah. So with brims, if I clicked on it, there's no description. No. So what happens with brims is that the the first layers are going to be printed differently, specifically the contact layers of the uh, of your object, right? So it's going to be printing a very thick first contact layer that is going to guarantee that your object uh, is properly adhered to the to the build plate. And I'll show you in the pictures. Um, I'm sorry, but okay, I'll, I'll, I'll go. I'll, I'll get into that question in, in just a second. So, you know, just we talked about the speed, we talked about the size, uh, and the fact that you can print these massive parts. Uh, we were actually working on the orientation of the part. 
And here is where we, we we get to the testing, and, and and I'll plug it to the to the to the Prims question, right? So what happened here? Oh, maker but tough. Uh, we've talked about so the fact that it's actually we are we are not printing with any plastic. We are printing with maker but tough, which is a it's quite. Somebody had a a, a question at the beginning around uh, ABS. I am not a big fan of uh, ABS just because A, it produces a lot of fumes when you're printing it and you can already, you can tell just by smelling it and those fumes are a little bit, they're not the best. Uh, whereas PLA, it's, it's safe to print in, a, in an office environment, in a school environment. And also, TOF is going to be, tough, it's, it's going to be stronger A than ABS and instead of shattering like ABS would, you can see here at, at the GIF on the right, ABS actually is a little bit more compliant uh, to that to, to a force being applied to it. It bends a little bit more. It's a little bit more elastic, and that was the perfect material for the type of forces that we were playing with, right? With if you think about that little orange uh, thing being or behaving like the board, it's basically what we're trying to do. We're trying to break um, a flat piece of plastic, right? And if we had we used ABS, it becomes much more brittle uh, for us. So. Here's the first test. This is where things uh, get interesting, right? That was the first print that we did. You can see kind of the dimples. And here's Andrew testing it out. And you, you very basic test, right? We just took it against an edge, basically this, uh, this um, stoop, stoop, yeah? Uh, and, and play with it some, right? So I'll play it one more time, uh, just because it's, it's kind of fun to see. But you can see, you know, slowly adding weight to it, slowly trying to see, okay, is it going to hold? Is it not going to hold? And we were surprised, actually. We were surprised that this early on in the process, we were already getting something, you know, even without the wheels and even without anything, but something that would withstand um, quite a considerable load, right? Um, oh, sorry. Quite a considerable load on itself. And here we have a <laughs> few other examples. I'll wait for it to load for you guys to see. But on the, on the left one is the one that I was talking about uh, at the very beginning, right? So we have the simple snap, <laughs> the snapping features. That's where when we were first adding uh, the holes, the pattern holes in the board, uh, then on the center, you know, the same idea. So the carve out board and also failing. And finally, we ended up with a geometry that was successful to the point that we were starting to make, to play tricks with it, right? So you could start spinning on a, on a single wheel, kind of jumping around. It didn't last for that long, but it was enough of a proof of concept for us to move forward with it and be able to test it out. And here's what you guys are asking. So when it prints and while it's printing, um, there is a very thick bead that's, it's, it's going to be hard to see here in the examples. And I promise I can, I can if you guys uh, reach out later, but it's basically a specific setting in MakerBot print called Brims that is going to allow you to have a very thick first contact layer with the printer. And that, it's, it's incredible. I'm, I am not entirely sure how it works. I know that it does because you can see it in the pictures. Uh, but it's just that very thick first layer that's going to help you, you know, help your object from, from tipping over. Uh, and I'm hoping that, that I answered uh, your guys' question. Yeah, that was great. They also wanted to know about the compression strength uh -huh. in comparison to ABS. Okay. Um, I don't have the numbers at hand. I know that it's comparable. I mean, the thing is, so my quick summary on TOF versus ABS, right? Uh, the impact strength is higher than the ABS. Uh, it's more compliant, so you can see it. And actually, I have a good example of that uh, right here. Let me come back to the webcam. But it's, uh, this is another example that we printed in TOF, right? Uh, it's, it's basically just a spring. But you guys can see you know, how much, and I have the springs isolated on themselves, the, how it's behaving. And this is not even solid. This is a 10% Intel. Um, so that's the second feature that I really like about the tough material. It's the fact that it's it's kind of bendy, but it's also really strong, uh, at, you know, against compression uh, loading. The number itself, um, I would follow up with that, and if you guys, uh, you know, if you reach out, we'll, we'll happily give you the specific specs. Or uh, if you go to makerbot.com slash tough, I believe. Uh, it is pretty much the same or in line with ABS. And the third big piece of uh, tough versus ABS is the fact that, well, you don't need, with ABS, ABS is really sensitive. I'm sure that everybody out there who's been uh, using ABS for injection molding knows the rate of, um, uh, how is it called? The shrinkage rate in ABS. So after you heat up ABS and when you cool it, it shrinks a lot. 
And that causes a lot of deformation that can translate with, uh, into two things. It can ha make the part detach from the build plate, so it, it trips over. Specifically for this type of application, when the part needs to be firmly attached to, to the build plate, it can be chaotic. And it can also cause individual layers to peel from one another, right? Because as you're extruding the ABS, and if you don't have a very controlled uh, environment, it's going to be really hard for you to get a successful print. So for, for injection molding, it's perfect the material. We all know the, the Lego example. For rapid prototyping and 3D printing, I, I am still not sold on it, specifically because there's other materials that are not as aggressive as toxic and have better performance in many points, like tough specifically, uh, than, than ABS, right? So again, just the, I actually have another example right here. This one, this is pretty cool. Um, just a tetrahedron. It's printed in a single, in a single, as a single object. I'll put it here really close. So you see how thin, let's see, yeah, there we go. If the camera actually focuses, there we go. So it's printed as a single object, that, that seam is just a single seam. And it's rather robust, right? It's, it's rather impressive to see that such a, a thin seam is able to withstand that much energy and still flex around. So I, you know, I think that for these types of application, that type of flexing is also good. Like if you think about doing some like a cap, right? So the cap is going to be, to be um, held up in place. Um, so I, I really like the, the tough materials and application. And that was what we used for, for the, for the how Sorry, much is case. tough? Compared to regular? How much does it cost, yeah? Uh, could you check on the website? Yeah. <laughs> it's, I'm sorry. It's a little bit pricier. Okay. It's a little bit pricier. And actually, we, we just launched um, three new colors. So actually, $65. $65 for a spool? Yeah. Okay. So $65 for a spool. And I would say, like, for example, to take the, uh, uh, let me go back to the screen, uh, the skateboard. To take the skateboard as a reference. One of those skateboards would be using, if I'm not mistaken, about a third of the of the of the spool. So 20 bucks a skateboard. That's not too bad. <laughs> uh, but yeah, we just launched um, tough with new colors. Uh, let me go back here. So we have safety orange, which is the one that I was using for for most of the boards. We have uh, uh, onyx Sweet. black and slate gray. Um, as well. That, that's really serious and I, I really like the look of it. Uh, we also have stone white, uh, you know, just for white. Uh, and those would be the four colors that we that we have. And, and two kilograms of filament, I believe, right? Two, ki two pounds. Two pounds. Two pounds, 900 grams. Yeah, it depends on uh, metric or imperial, whatever you use. But yeah, two, two pounds or uh, 900 grams. And again, another thing that I wanted to touch on, on uh, talking about supports um, is uh, this, this geometry specifically. Where are we? Yeah, we're, we're good. Because I have a lot of questions about supports. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So I have two examples for supports. I mean, I, I just showed an, an extreme case of using brims and not using supports, uh, like with what happens with the, with the boards. And I, I forgot to show the final board. And I'll get to that, I promise, before we, we run out of time. But I wanted to talk about supports, right? So what happens? With supports and how we see it, how are supports affected by your part orientation? In this case, all that we have is this uh, helix, uh, helix. It's basically a conveyor uh, threaded helix that's going to be you know counting objects moving forward in the, in a line, um, and it was printed like that, so flat on its side, uh, and it's great. You know the quality is it's, it's actually really good, but a couple of things to note. Right in the center, right. So right in the in the in the, that axis where where the eh, I'm trying to, to look at you guys. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so right on on the core of it, there's going to be a lot of supports, and especially in this part because it's a really long one, it might be tricky to get those supports out. The way that Maker but print print supports makes it here makes it very easy to remove them, right? So you can see, like even. I can remove them by hand. You can, I don't know if you can hear that noise, but it's like, there we go, right? So you can remove them. I mean, it's actually, it, it does a great job. The R slicer does a great job. Let me try to focus that. Come on. There we go. So the quality is, is, is um, I would say it, it's good on the, on the, the way the supports attach and it's really easy to remove them. However, there's going to be a lot in these very long sections, right? So. I might struggle a little bit with getting it out. 
And just by doing a simple change on that geometry, of course, this, this one is smaller. I printed it just as a, you know, as a sample for you guys uh, to look at, but on the implication and to know the implications on, on the supports, right? So in this case, the supports are going to be stair-stepping through the, through, through the threaded elements of this helix. Uh, but I won't be getting any supports, there you go, any supports in the core, right? So it's, it's going to be important for us to be able to, um, well, that's, that's a reason why we have preview in Print, right? Just to make an estimation on how the supports are going to perform and to know what are our constraints. So if in this case, I really wanted these geometries to perform without support specifically in the core, well, I could just tilt it up or upwards. And it actually, in this case, it will use more support. So you can see how even, you know, even a, a, granted they are different size uh, print, but you can see the proportion, right, of supports in this one versus this one is much higher. So this one is going to be faster, yes, but the, you know, it comes with the constraint of, hey, you have now supports in the core. And this one is going to be slower, but you won't have supports in the center. And even though it's fairly easy to remove them, it's also a choice that you guys need to make and uh, you know, understand that it comes with its sets of uh, uh, challenges once you, once you try to do that. Um, but yeah, no, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting question. At what angle do you think uh, you need to start having supports? At what? Especially for the skateboard. Oh, that's a good question. So the question is, at what angle do we do I think that you need to start having supports? As I said, the standard that we that we use at MakerBot uh, is uh, 65 degrees. That's what we recommend. I would say um, anything steeper than 60, you should be. You can push it into 60. It depends on the resolution, right? Because it doesn't quite fail like you know you're at 65 and then you go to 62 and it just crashes on itself it's not like that but it starts starts drooping quite noticeably um let's see is this one a little yeah this, this could be a good example of that let's so i printed this one with very fast settings because i wanted it to be ready by by the webinar but you can see here, let's uh, try to make the camera focus on it. Come on. You can see here that it's drooping quite a bit on the underside, right? So it all depends on, on how good a quality do you want on the, on the base layer of your, of your object. If you're okay with the, with the object drooping a little bit, then I would say you can push it to 60 maybe. But personally, I would say anything, anything, um, uh, shallower than 60 will need supports, uh, especially on the on the on the on the skateboard. Uh, yeah. Do you have a final prototype with trucks? <laughs> of course. So, final prototype. Yeah. Uh, this was the fun one, right? Uh, this one that was the one that we used, and I'll actually uh, we had a few of them, and we broke a few of them as well. Uh, and this one will show a couple of things again and tough. So the final, the final kind of hero item. Uh, there's there's two things that I ended up using in the in the final one. So first off was you can see the dimples made it made the final cut right, uh, and then I added one specific feature that I thought was you know interesting and kind of clever. The fact that you know you can now grab your board and take it around with you, maybe even tie it up to your to your backpack or whatnot. Um, also, I I did end up using the Voronoi pattern at least on the on the at the bottom of the board. Uh, it's not going through, but it it gives you that interesting illusion, that kind of nice pattern uh, look to it. It makes it a little bit more appealing. And kind of the moment of truth. And I hope that this doesn't let me down because we've been trying it quite a few times today. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, secret notes. You cannot see the secret notes. Let's remove here. I'm trying to just making sure that it's on the. Oh, there you go. Yeah, it's got to go far further up. Uh, <laughs> here's it. Yay! You see? So, you know, it's. I, I'm, a, I'm a terrible skateboarder, I would say that. And I'm actually, you cannot see this, but I'm actually holding myself on the print. <laughs> so, uh, but. You get the, the idea, right? So it, it, it sort of it sort of works. Um, it does work. I'm just 
really bad at skateboarding. Um, sorry for that. That's okay. We have another question because of that. Uh -huh. uh, they're asking if you inlaid the bolt holes in the top for strength, or how did you make sure that uh, you could put those in? The bolts? Yeah. Uh, if I designed the holes for the bolts? Yeah. Yes. So that's, an, that's a good one. Let me, let me show you one slide here. Uh, going back to my presentation. But the cool thing about tough is that you can actually thread and tap into it, right? Um, if you make it 100% solid, then you'll be able to entirely thread directly. In this case, what I did was I basically, and that's why I left some of this open. I'll come back to the video here. Right, so you can see here uh, where am I? Yeah. So I did create the, the, the I, I, I did create the holes in, in CAD. However, did, did I add, not not for this one because of the fact that I wanted I, I, I wanted let me take out one of these. They're not entirely tied uh, for this one because I, I wasn't sure if I was going to be asked to dismantle it. But mm -hmm. here. So I'm using just just you know conical uh, screws. And because I knew that it was going to be a conical screw, I wanted the screw to push itself uh, onto the plastic. That's why I didn't add any bevels. Um, you could if you wanted to. But the cool thing about tough, and that's why, again, I purposely chose not to add bevels, is that it gives it's, it lets, lends itself to uh, for you to thread into it and to tap into it. So if you compress it, it'll actually become chewy, and you'll be able to, to really tie and thread something into it, which is something that I really like about it. Again. It's not. It's not like you're threading into wood, right? It's, it's not. It's not quite that, but it's definitely something that, that will give you or be able to be threaded into, and will hold on to the the bolt and the uh, or the screw in this in this case uh, fairly easily. Yeah. Do you need an experimental extruder to print on tough? No, but I did use one. So, uh, no, you don't. You need a tough extruder. The reason for that is that. Our tough extruder is rated to actually withstand uh, the tough material. You could also use an experimental extruder, and the reason why I use an experimental extruder is because, especially for these for these final prototypes that I brought brought in today, I wanted them to print really fast. So, the experimental extruder comes with a different set of nozzles. Our standard nozzle is 0.4 millimeters. It, the experimental extruder comes with four. It comes with 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8 and a 0.6 stainless steel nozzle. And I actually ha have it here. This is the extruder that I use to print. So it's kind of fancy, right? I really, not, not to brag, but I actually designed the, this, this, <laughs> uh, the, 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 this one. So I'm proud of it. Uh, but anyways, the reason why I used it was because I was able to use a thicker nozzle. And what that cost in turn was it saves a lot of time while printing. I can print at a higher layer resolution. Uh, actually, well, lower resolution, higher layer, so you know, the thicker the layer, the lower the resolution, uh, which makes it go way faster. And also, the thicker beads sometimes help with the structural rigidity. But again, you don't need to use uh, tough, uh, sorry, the experimental extruder to print with tough. You can just use a regular tough extruder and print with tough. And they all work with any of our machines, wh whether it be the Replicator Plus, the, uh, the Mini, or the Z18 right here. Mm -hmm. Cool. Does tough have the same problem as PLA in direct sunlight? I believe it does, but it's rather like sunlight really only melts or warps PLA yeah. after a long time. So if you're talking about, there's two things that I, I'm not sure what problem specifically you're talking about. If you melt, if you mean melting, well, uh, it's a thermoplastic. So any plastic that you, you know, if you increase the temperature high enough, if you go higher than say 40 C, 50 degrees C, you start seeing some melting, and 50 degrees C is, is going to be like 110, 115 ish uh, Fahrenheit. Uh, you'll yourself see some melting and some deformation. If you're talking about the fact that it can get, become brittle after time, I haven't seen that in tough. That I like a lot of also, because I've seen that for some of my old prints in regular PLA become brittle, and if you touch them again, they just like shatter. Uh, I'm not sure why that is. Uh, I don't know if they lose uh, a lot of moisture or capture much. I'm not sure what that happens, but I haven't seen that in tough. I'm not sure why. Uh, but yeah. Um, 
let me keep moving into the slides and then I'll, I'll, I'll open the floor for more, you know, a more open discussion. So as I said, we have a few, few colors, safety orange, slate gray, onyx black, stone white, they are pretty cool. Uh, I really like, personally, I like the, the onyx and the, the orange the best, but you know, uh, it's up to you guys. Um, we've seen a lot of our customers use it, specifically in this case, uh, you know, KUKA Robotics, we went to visit them last year uh, in Germany it was a really nice PC. They had a bunch of C18s and they were using to prototype all of the robots. Well, specifically these human interaction robots. What that means is robots that are actually interacting with, uh, with operators close by. And they were printing them out in the Z18 and uh, you know, it's just starting to get uh, to using, uh, started using the tough filament, so that was great. And it's, it's kind of the application that, 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 that we, 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 oh sorry, that we, that we want you guys to think about, right? And this, this is another example that I have here, right? So it's this, this one I printed, it's a, it's a different example, but it's it's the um, same idea of something that sort of, it may, it's, it's going to be noisy. So I'll, I'll move it around first and then I'll talk later. So it moves you know, in different angles and the cool thing is that it actually can snap out and in, right? <laughs> Sorry about that, but yeah. That's kind of the idea of Tough. You want, you want it, it's better suited for act, uh, prototypes that are going to be performing an actual uh, task, right? You're going to be applying a load like with the skateboard or you're going to be moving them around like with these, uh, with these robotic arms that KUKA's doing. Uh, and it's great for that because it actually lends itself great to mechanical prototypes. Um, Moving forward, there's another thing that this is, you know, just a side note. We actually are running a C18 bundle uh, right now. You would need to be to to get in contact. You can, you know, write me an email, uh, Felipe at MakerBot, or write directly to our sales team. Uh, even write it in the if you're interested it here in, in the in the, the chat. But basically, you're getting a free replicator plus if you buy three C18s. I know that's a lot, but if you're trying to start a studio, if you're trying to start uh, you know, an engineering uh, setup, this is a great place to start. Just the fact that you have the massive view volume and you know, getting a free printer is always, always, always great, depending on the size of your, your team. But just so you know, uh, in case you guys were interested in that, uh, it's another thing to, to note. Um, but yeah, we went through you know, the design process. We talked about kind of different ideas as we projected the Voronoi, we projected the dimple surface to add grip on it maximizing the print volume by using the hypotenuses on the prints on the printers and that's true for any printer it's not just a replicator uh, not just a z18 but any printer can benefit from that it depends on the proportion of your printer right so if i try to apply the same logic to say the replicator plus because of the fact that the largest um, axis is going to be my x-axis it's going to be more challenging to print without supports while benefiting from that massive um, or that extended uh, longitudinal, longitudinal uh, hypotenuse, right? I showed you guys the testing. That was that was really fun. You know, we rolled the the skateboard. The skateboard's right here. If you guys are interested, I can also uh, follow up with the files, the STL files. I'll probably upload them to Thingiverse. And we talked about the importance of slicing and, and orienting, right? So just again connecting it to the to the whole idea of what happens when. You know, depending on how you, you orient your shape before slicing, what happens when you do draft printing, how can you expedite the times, and finally, hopefully, at least to a degree, you know, the successful print. So you saw that it, it actually, it was good, it was good. Uh, the, 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 you know, the final, the final result of it was that we, we actually were able to show this off at the, during Design Week. We went to Frog Design, a studio nearby, as I said at the very beginning. And we, yeah, it was entered in, a, in an auction. It was the, the skateboard, one of the skateboards was auctioned. Uh, the, the, the proceedings went to uh, a charity, helping kids get involved in, uh, in artistic and, um, and design related uh, activities. So it's, it's pretty good. Uh, that will be kind of my, my summary, my wrap up. And now, you know, I know that we are a little bit over time, but I'll stick around if you guys are. If you have any questions, um, feel free to throw them out to yeah. Allison. I have a couple more. Mm -hmm. um, how long did that final prototype take to make, to print? The skateboard? Mm -hmm. it, that one was 30, I want to say 36 hours, just about 36 hours. And it depends a lot on the, the final one, this one was 36. It changes a lot depending on uh, your settings, right? So 
I have another one that I printed on the draft one. I don't know where I left it. The white one? Yeah. Oh, it's right here. So this one, uh, this one, this one I printed in eight hours. I'm not kidding. I mean, I know that it's kind of crazy. But, 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 kind of the, the, the thing with this one is the fact that, you see, it's almost hollow. So there's no way that this will hold my weight. But for the quick test uh, that I wanted to run, that's what, this was enough. So again, this could be either, and it's, it's a very similar size of geometry. So you got them both here, eight hours in the white one and 36 hours on the dark one. The changes are on the shells, the changes are on the layer height. Um, so yeah, it depends on, on your settings. Um, can regular material be printed from the tough extruder or vice versa? Yes, but not vice versa. So you can print you can print regular material in the tough extruder. Uh, actually, it prints uh, no problem. You do need to slice it. Uh, you know, the printer will ask you to slice it for the tough extruder. Um, however, if you try printing, you it's I shouldn't say this, but <laughs> <laughs> I know the thing is you can actually print the tough material with the regular extruder, but it is actually going to compromise the life expectancy of the extruder. And I've seen that happen. Uh, so it's possible, but then after a few cy cycles, the, the spring on the extruder can wear out. And uh, I wouldn't recommend it personally. You can, you can definitely print regular material in tough extruder, but not tough material in the regular extruder. It's possible for a few prints, but you will be compromising your system. Um, I have some questions about if you can, would this work on a replicator? Obviously, it needs to be split. Mm -hmm. um, somebody else was saying, if you wanted to print this in, say, a two sections and then bolt them together, would it have the rigidity once you tread sections of it, like a puzzle connection? Yes, so that's an interesting one. I, and it's one that I didn't quite test out. Uh, you could think about that. It's something to experiment on. You, you know, you're kind of naturally uh, integrating a failure point to your assembly. Uh, but there are examples of very nifty assemblies that, you know, dovetail different parts to one another and actually perform okay. So it, it all depends on, on the way, I mean, I wouldn't just, you know, uh, butt them together. You would need to, to do some sort of assembly in them to, to, to make sure that they hold on to each other. It's possible. We didn't quite test it out because we had the luxury of using uh, the, the, the Z18 and that was enough for, for our purposes. I have, you know, <laughs> and a final example of the size of this guy here. Right? So it, you can see, you know, it's, it's pretty massive, the build volume. It's actually uh, one head. You, you, we should advertise it as, you can print one head in the Z18. Uh, but no, so it's possible. Um, it's a different challenge, and it's one that we didn't quite solve for it uh, in, this, uh, in this one. Cool. Um, this is more of a tech Z18 question. Have you looked into swapping out a heated bed, um, or have you ever updated bearings that keep failing? Have, oh, yeah, the <laughs> bearings. Um, the bearings, we hear that uh, often. It's, uh, it's something that we're working on. I think that the new generation one has different bearings, but it, it has to do with the, with the additional travel time. So the, you know, because we increase the volume so much, then it takes quite a few um, moves to reach the different, the different corners. So that's my comment on the bearings. Uh, the other question was, oh, the heated build plate, right. No, I have not used a heated build plate and the reason for that is that heated build plate is better suited for something that's more uh, thermically sensible like ABS. So since I'm using uh, you know, PLA and tough, I don't require a heated build plate. The heated build plate helps a lot with addition uh, for those materials that tend to warp a lot and to shrink a lot. I don't have that problem with tough and with regular uh, material, which I love. You know, I would rather not spend <laughs> the, the extra money and just uh, get the results that I want. And as I said, there's enough diversity in tough and, and, and PLA for me. For the pros, for, again, it depends on the application that you're looking at. But you know, for something that's uh, technical and that's you know that's kind of performing for you, I think uh, you're better off without the, the using ABS. That's it. Cool. Well, thank you guys a lot for joining. Uh, <laughs> it's been quite, a, quite, you know, it's, it's a great second one. Uh, I'm sure we'll be doing a, a third one. We actually, I brought one example of, of a thing that I just, uh, I was working on the past couple of weeks. It's a, it's a drone. It actually works. Let me show you guys here. I, I created one. It's also using um, tough, 
But, you know, the challenge with this one was kind of more into the tolerances. Uh, there's even got the camera right there, right there, right? Um, you know, the tolerances, the electronics. So we, we are trying to think about what the next uh, webinar is going to be. We're not sure. But if you have any ideas, please make sure to, to send them send them our way, either Felipe at MakerBot or, um, yeah. Sales at MakerBot. Sales at MakerBot, yeah. Uh, if you have any questions, also, you know, anything that you forgot to ask. And uh, again, to the people watching us from uh, the LATAM region, I know there was a ton of you guys. Uh, so if in the future you'd be interested in doing a, a Spanish one, I'm sorry I'm not speaking Portuguese for those of you guys out <laughs> in Brazil, but if you'd be interested in, in doing a, a Spanish one, we could certainly do that as well. Uh, and for the rest of you, well, thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot for joining. Um, this, is, this is really exciting for me to be able to share kind of my process with you guys. And again, feel free to, to reach out to felipe at makerbot.com uh, and I'll try to reply to all of the questions and I'll make sure to reply to all of the questions that, that come along. But for now, uh, I think that's it on, on our end. Uh, thank you guys so much for joining and uh, yeah, we're looking forward to seeing you guys next time. Thank you. <laughs>